This excerpt was taken from the Full and Bloom interview with bassist Tony Franklin. You can listen to the entire interview at fullandbloom.com. Click the link in the description. Was Glenn Hughes originally slated to front Blue Murder? No, no, no. Okay. Well, there was never any connection with Glenn Hughes and Blue Murder? Um, yeah, his name was probably mentioned, and both John and I knew him, and, uh, but, uh, and I think, uh, you know, Cozy, of course, Cozy Bell was the original drummer, so, sure. you know, there, there might have been, there might have been, he could have come up in a, in a conversation, but it was never, never more than that. I mean, the Ray Gillen, that went further. I just saw that out on the internet, and I thought, wow, I hadn't heard the Glenn Hughes yet, but I knew Cozy and Ray Gillen were originally in the band, and of course I've heard, I just um, not too long ago interviewed uh, Greg Chasen, so I, you know, researched and then found that um, one demo of Too Late, and uh, thought, God, that was just fantastic. Did you guys record more songs with Cozy and Ray? Um... Cozy definitely played on some of the early demos. So that would, would be Riot, uh, Tommy, Out of Love, the, the, the possibly uh, Blue Murder, the track. Um, I think that was it. And those might be on the internet, but I believe that's with John singing. Um, I have to look on that. And I'm, for some reason, I'm thinking the phrase early voyages or early something. It's the demos, and that, that is Cozy playing that. Um, Ray, we tried him on a bunch of songs, including those that I just mentioned. And um, the thing with Ray is that, uh, you know, John John had a, had a vision. There was a sound and everything that John has and that Ray has. And there were some things that Ray did phenomenally, uh, but, but there were some where John uh, just was showing Ray and it was just like, it was right, it was perfect. And there was nothing against Ray, it was just a different sound and a vibe. And John wanted Ray to be more involved in some of the writing too. And Ray's writing is different to uh, to what John's vision was. So, you know, they they probably I wasn't there the whole time. I was there a fair bit. John and Ray probably were together for about three months, really trying to make it work. And it was because we wanted to make it work because we love the guy, sweet, sweet guy, and obviously very, very talented. But it was, it wasn't any of that. It was just that the musically we were just slightly different. And it was uh, John had this had this vision, and, and just once again, every time John sang, it was exactly what what it needed. So it was a tough decision, and um, but I don't think any of those demos uh, 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 lasted, I think, uh, with Ray singing, other than the, the Too Late song, which uh, you know, didn't end up on the album anyway. And Too Late, is that with Cozy, or is that Carmine playing drums? That's, that's Cozy. That album also was the first time, I, I think, that Bob Rock produced a record, correct? I mean, I know he had been involved with a ton of records, but he was an engineer, I think, up to that point. Was that his first big yeah, production? I, yeah, I did. I don't know. That's a very good point. I didn't think so, but uh, now that you mention it that way, I, I truly don't know. Yeah, because he was Bruce's engineer, you know, through the Bon Jovi record to the Lover Boy, all those uh, giant records. And then from there, I think he got the very next one was the Motley Crue record. Dr. Fieldberg, yeah, absolutely. So you might be right. And um, I know that John had worked with Bob Rock on the Whitesnake uh, 87 album. They, they cut a bunch of tracks up there in Vancouver. And Bob was, was the one that was... Uh, getting John sound. So for that reason alone, I mean, other reasons, but of course, but he wanted Bob on, on board because he was the one that uh, got that great sound. And so, uh, yeah, you might be right. 
he might be right with that, actually. What was it like working with Bob Rock, maybe as compared to other producers you've worked with? Is there anything that kind of stands out? He was, uh, no, he was great. He was, he was a musician, and so he knew how to play and knew how to hang and relate to us. And he was, for me, for my part, now that was, those were cut separately, but we went in and played it as a band first and so we got the overall vibe and cut to a click and then Carmine went in and we cut all the drums and uh, he Bob was great because he he was he brought out the best in everybody's performance without feeling like he's getting on them he was uh, he's just very very good with uh, relationships and and bringing out the best in the players so you know it's Tom, I'm a swore he had no more drum fills left after that album. He, he used them all up. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, but he had a way of just like, yeah, that's cool, but we, we need to do this. Of course, this was, uh, this was all on tape, no Pro Tools, so you know, everything had to be played. And so, um, but with me, I once all the uh, drums were done, then I went in, I think it was, I was in there for like four days just laying down bass on everything. And everything was very quick for me. And uh, we probably did, uh, I don't know, two or three songs a day. And it was, it was, it was very focused, but relaxed too. And he was the same with me, but I was, I was full of ideas and, and full of stuff. And I, I knew exactly what I wanted. I, I just remember him, you know, just, saying, yeah, that's the one, or, or let's do that one again, but nothing too much, because I was, uh, I was just, I felt like I had a lot to prove, and so I put everything into that, and we were very well rehearsed going into that as well, so uh, that was, uh, that was cool, but he's, yeah, he's great, because he has the ears, he has the producer's uh, awareness, but he's a musician too, so a great combination. How long did that album yeah. take to record? It was a draw process but not the initial tracks what was going on was probably two weeks for the final drums four days for the uh for the bass and then it was uh mostly mostly rhythms and some leads but i don't know to be honest it could have been three weeks four weeks but we weren't keeping a, a very uh rigorous uh schedule during, during that during that time we were just as the vibe happened except jelly roll now that was one song that uh, happened very very quickly um, I'd actually shown John the open D tuning, D flat as it happened to be, which is one that Roy Harper had shown me. And uh, so John took it on the acoustic guitar and went away and wrote Jelly Roll. And then we got a call late at night. John wanted Carmine to come in and lay down drums. And we were out and having a few few beverages and Carmine was uh you know, he was he was not as focused as he would want to be, but if you ask him now, but he went and laid it down in one shot. They actually punched in in uh it was so there's two halves to it. It was like the you know, the the, the up front section and then the, the ballad section. And he punched in somewhere during the, the big monster long fill that joins the front section to the end section and then played it to the end. So that was all one, essentially one take with a break in the middle. And then uh, same for me with the bass. I just kind of laid it down. It's one of those parts that just emerged and the whole song was like that. So, but then John still was not convinced that he wanted to do vocals. So vocal tryouts went on for quite a while. Even then we, they took the album back to LA and kept working on that. And uh, actually it was the last time that I saw Ray as well. He dropped by the uh, the studio just to say hi. Yeah, he wasn't looking to sing. He was just something I we remained friends. So he was coming to check it out. And so uh, to be 88. Yeah, and, and so, so that uh, the vocal search was still continuing even after Ray was out of the picture. Oh, yeah. They tried out a bunch of guys in, in Vancouver. I mean, talk about expensive auditioning uh, people live in the studio, in the recording studio. So, yeah, they were still trying out guys and then... Was there anybody that was known that, that you tried out, or were they just unknown guys? 
mostly on the, there might be a few guys. I wasn't I wasn't in on a lot of that. That would drive me nuts just trying out different guys. You know, the uh, no real name guys. Although you know, Tony Martin was involved in the the writing of some of the lyrics in Valley of the Kings. And uh, there was, you know, the, I think there was talk for a second that uh, of him trying out, but uh, which he may have done when when we were cutting that one. But that's before we actually started the album recording proper. And it was just like he's a great singer, but it wasn't the right uh, sound. It's more of a bluesy kind of feel, you know, that that we needed. And Tony Martin isn't that. He's more got that kind of Dio kind of uh, yeah. Uh, going on so great singer and so you know that was uh, probably the the biggest name but yeah and then john was still laying down solos and did the vocals uh in la so you know stretched out it's probably over the period of about uh, about nine months but actual recording time was you know maybe a, a couple to three months after the first album it seems like that was successful and uh you guys tour and then what happens on the second album where you and Carmine don't complete the recording and then I don't think you guys did the tour, right? No, we I, I played on seven of the 11 tracks on Nothing But Trouble. It's a great album. Um, well, what happened? I mean, you say it was a success, and it was to a degree, but the, the, there's always a lot of would have, could have, should have with, with Blue Murder. And to be honest, it should have been way bigger than it was. And there were some mistakes that were made in hindsight, not all of our own doing. Uh, some of them, you know, things are out of your control. But, I mean, that, to me, should have been the biggest band of that era. And what do you so think the mistakes, was, sorry to interrupt, but what, do you, what were some of the, like, label mistakes, just not marketing it right, or what? Yeah, yeah, some decisions that were made. I mean, uh, Valley of the Kings was uh, had a huge push on MTV, but here's the thing. Valley of the Kings was not available for people to buy as a single, and um, it should have been, or it should have been a different song in, in hindsight. So what happened was that MTV played the crap out of it, and then... Um, but then they were really bent out of shape that it was not available for people to buy as a single, which, you know, whatever, whatever, it's like fine. But when Jelly Roll came out and was starting to cross over and get a lot of airplay, MTV wouldn't touch it. And so because MTV wouldn't touch it, uh, it didn't get, it didn't cross over to the mainstream radio and, and get all of that airplay. If it had it done, it, I'm, I'm convinced that song would have been huge. Um, and so, anyway, you know that that was all of that was very tough for John. He took it. He put so much heart and soul into this, and went into some periods of, of depression. And uh, after all of that, and it took him a good few years to to really to get get through that. And uh, in the meantime, a little band called Nirvana came out and changed turned the music business and, and everything completely on its head. And so Blue Murder's music was then completely out of vogue. And so, um, you know, it was just, to be honest, it was just, uh, John needed to sort of stuff out. And uh, it was it was taking a little bit too long for, for Carmine and myself. And so, you know, we hung in there as long as we could. And then it was just like, okay, John, just just needs you to finish this off and, and do your thing. And it was, it was tough because they my family still are and uh, we, we love the music, but it's like nothing was getting done and we, you know, we couldn't just, we couldn't wait. And so uh, we played our parts. I say I played on seven of the tracks and uh, still love the album and John and I still jam some songs from the album. And, um, but yeah, it kind of run its course and, uh, and then we went on our different ways for, uh, for a few years. I'd imagine yeah. that, um, that it was hard for him. Not only the Blue Murder stuff, but also that uh, how White Snake ended. He had uh, songwriting credits on that album, but he was supposed to be on that tour. Yeah, financially he did fine, but once again, yeah, two situations where uh, you know he should have had the recognition for his immense talent, and both times it didn't happen. So yeah, you're right. It wasn't only Blue Murder. It was like finally uh, like sinking in that 
the, all the blue, all the white snake, white snake stuff that he was uh, didn't have the, the glory from. But so yeah, it was tough. And yeah, we, we've talked about that now, and it was it was a tough time for all of us. But uh, hey, you know, you live to fight on another day. Did he ever tell you why he was yeah. fired from White Snake? Um, no. No, not really. And if he did, I mean, I've heard so many different sides of that, and I, I don't want to speculate because I wasn't there. And I'm friends with dear friends with both with David and with uh, with John. I don't want to get in the middle of that. What's John like to work with? He's uh, he's great. He can, he's he can be difficult. He's very focused and doesn't suffer fools gladly. And uh, but the, you know, and, and of late, I mean, we have such a great friendship and vibe between us, and always the musical chemistry is the is the thing that that um, that bonds us together. I mean, he is. We we just we always had that thing, that vibe, that chemistry, and so uh, yeah, I've seen. I know he can be difficult, but uh, he's very. He has no problem speaking his mind, and if something isn't to his. Uh, to his liking, or if it doesn't seem right, then he'll have no problem speaking up with that. And he and I have had, you know, our ups and downs, but we get each other. We we have so much love and respect for each other that uh, that that I'll defend him to, to the end because uh, you know he has this reputation of being difficult and awkward, but uh, you know I understand it. I understand where he's coming from, and it's it's from a maybe it's a perfectionism. Maybe it's just something, you know, he knows what he likes and what he wants. And so, uh, you know, he has no no problem striving for that and, and speaking up about it. So some people don't like that. Where does Carmine rank on your list of drummers that you've worked with? Oh, gosh. And I've, I've worked with some amazing, amazing drummers. I've been very, very fortunate in that regard from, you know, Chris Slade to... Terry Bozio to to Vinnie Caliuta to Greg this and that and oh gosh I've been I've been very lucky in that regard. Uh, Carmine's right up there and he and I just know each other. We just uh, musically and and as people too. And we, it's the same thing with him and I. We just have a lot of love and respect for each other and. We know where each other's going when uh, when something was going on musically. We we just know it and have that uh, instant understanding of of things. So I never like to pick a favorite drummer because every one of them brings something different to the to the table to the equation. And so yeah, I have my he's he's definitely definitely up there though. So uh, I love him. 